Right, this week we're reviewing the Catalyst SA Property Equity Fund and Kirby is going to set the scene for us. All right, I mean, uh, we've had Paul with us uh, from Cape Town. He manages this fund with uh, a gentleman by the name of Zaid Suleiman. The formation date here is February 2005. Fund size about 581 million. I mean, very nice fund size for a, for, for a listed property fund. Uh, the benchmark there, the listed property index and the total expense ratio of about 1.13. Let me just briefly run through the performance numbers. 12 months, 12.4 versus 14.6. And then you see some of the, 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 the longer dated numbers. And let me end off with a five year number at 15 and a half versus 17.6. And um, just if you look at your screen there, let's just quickly look at uh, the rolling returns through time. You'll be used to the way that we look at returns. Uh, the blue bars or the blue areas, the shaded areas, as you see over there and, 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 and over there, are the fund's relative returns to the benchmark. So if you take the fund's return on a rolling 12-month basis and you subtract the benchmark, you get these kind of returns. And then to get an idea of what the actual benchmark has done, which in this case is the asset list, listed property index, you'll see the red line. And you can kind of see how that return has uh, has kind of played itself out over time. Now, <clears throat> interesting to see that over the period of 2007, there was some underperformance for this fund. Brief outperformance, maybe, you know, uh, kind of the, the ending portions of 2007, and then again, some underperformance if we look kind of the 2010 and 2011 period. I mean, maybe, Paul, just a quick question for me. Is this the right benchmark for your fund at the end of the day? Because, uh, because it seems like you're quite under it at the moment. Yeah, look, I mean, I think, I think at the time it seemed like the appropriate benchmark. It, it included uh, both puts and PLSs, the top 20 by market cap adjusted for free float. But the reality is it, it hasn't been. We've seen a significant change in the sector over the last five years. 35 stocks five years ago, uh, inclusions and exclusions in that benchmark. Literally every quarter, two or three, uh, means it's very unstable. But then more importantly, you've got two stocks in that benchmark, Redefine and, and Growth Point, which make up about 45%. And then the top four companies make up about 65%. Those top two companies I mentioned effectively account for 70% of the sector's liquidity. So not the most appropriate benchmark. Um, so it has been a, a pretty, pretty uh, difficult benchmark to, to track oneself against. So Paul, are you going to be changing your benchmark? And if, you, if so, what have you been thinking of changing it to? Look, I, th I think the, 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 we, we are considering a, a, a benchmark that has a, a capped sort of uh, weighting at around about 15%, similar to to what you have in the PCAP index. Unfortunately, that, that benchmark contains a 15% cap in the capital shopping centers, which again is not appropriate in a South African benchmark because it's UK real estate. Um, I do however think that the benchmark will improve going forward. We're gonna see significant new listings that'll dilute growth point and redefine over time. However, we do see, need to see significant improvement in, in the liquidity at the lower end of the, the benchmark because those inclusions and exclu exclusions mean that you, you have to change your, your positions quite significantly on the highly illiquid stocks. Uh, and that's really been a problem. The other issue with, with, the, with the sector, and, and Roland alluded to it earlier on, is cash. Um, highly liquid towards the back end of the market. And if you can look at the period from 2006 through to 2008, the fund went from sort of naught under management to 200 under management. Uh, for the period in, the, in the September 2007, the, the benchmark did 51%. Our fund did 47 Investors were ecstatic. We were horrified as active managers. But through that period, when you're carrying that much, getting such inflow from a very low base, we effectively were car carrying about 10% cash. When cash is giving you five yeah. and the index is giving you 50, that active position in cash is effectively costing you that entire underperformance, whereas your stock calls actually worked for you. It was a similar thing in, in 2010 and 11, where the fund went from 200 to 600. The average cash position over that period was also about, uh, about 15% or, or approximately 10, 15% and the benchmark did 30% over that period. So again, there's a cash is, is really, really hurting you. And yeah. through the period 2008 to 2010, where the fund was stable at 200 million, that's where actually you saw the performance come through quite nicely. Um, in our institutional funds, which don't have those kind of flows, we managed to outperform the benchmark by about one and a half percent over the same period. So retail flows, and particularly in an illiquid market like ours, it, it can be quite difficult yeah. with that cash drag when the market is as strong as it is. Brilliant. Um, I do think it is uh, the wrong benchmark. The, uh, if, if your benchmark is more volatile than your fund, you have a problem because uh, you can't compare it. What we tend to do is we look at uh, um, the, the, the exposures relative to equity and, and bonds because property is sort of something in between. And we find that about 85% uh, in, in bonds and 15% in equities generally is a much better benchmark to, to compare people to. Uh, I'd like to ask you, Paul, very quickly. I see that Emira makes part is up, uh, makes up uh, your fund, and I know that uh, it's going to. It's actually cited that for 2012, it's going to have a negative return. How often do you reweight re and relook at the company holdings? Very quickly. We look in, in the market. We're in the market every single day, and, and 
you know, obviously depending on whether the pricing is, we, we will either look at, at accumulating or, or, or reducing our, our position. Um, Emira is a stock that uh, has definitely underperformed in terms of its outlook going forward. Most, most property companies are guiding towards sort of inflationary type income growth for the next 12 months, whereas Emira um, are probably going to have, have uh, closer to negative growth. The main driver of that is that they've actually really battled to retain their tenants, and as a result of not being able to retain their tenants, uh, they're incurring significant costs in terms of commissions, tenant installations, rent-free periods, and I think that'll significantly hurt this 12-month period. Uh, obviously, a large portion of our, our major yeah. valuation methodology is a five-year DCF, so you know we try and look through the short term and try and value the stock on, on a yeah. on a longer-term valuation. Uh, but having said that, obviously, I, I don't think Emira is. I think Emira of the short term is, is definitely one to be to be a bit concerned about. But of the long term, I think the valuation is is still reasonably attractive relative to the rest Fantastic. of the market. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Well, we have to leave it there. Much appreciated for your time. A big thank you, of course, to Kirby and Rodens as well for joining us uh, on WealthQuest. Well, that's it for this edition of WealthQuest. We'll be back next week, Monday, at the same time, 8.30 p.m. Central African time, right here on CNBC Africa. Till then, from me, Eleni Jokos, and my guests, it's goodbye.